Okay, so Michael, as someone who received his master's degree at the New York Academy of Art and who now resides in Brooklyn, what sort of impact does living in a city like New York have on your art? Um, I mean, I think living in New York, it, it's kind of gone through stages. When I first went to grad school here, um, you know, I had professors like Eric Fischel and, you know, these world-renowned artists, and then you're going to their studio, and then you're kind of seeing like, okay, this is what you know, a top level artist is what a studio looks like in the city. And mm -hmm. right then I was just like, okay, that's what I, I want to do. I want to be a, um, a studio artist. I don't really want to teach. I want to be in the studio making work. And then, um, so like in the beginning, it was more about like, okay, that's New York City for an artist, you're having a studio. But then, you know, New York City is one of the centers or in some people, in my mind, you know, the center of the art world, you know, you have the top galleries here and they're, super close so I feel like you know in the earlier days you know being able to really know what's going on in the contemporary art world because it's in your backyard is very very beneficial because then you can understand your place in the contemporary art world um, as an artist and then it's the, and then it, to, and then as my career evolved I have a really great network uh, and I, they're all my friends of um, artists dealers collectors and um all in New York City. And also if they're not in New York City, they're in New York City at some point of the year for something else art related. So it's it's really, you know, I, I feel like central to my career. And you know, th these days I'm very selective of who I let in my studio, basically to see the work before a show. But, um, you know, it, it's the, the fact that it's, I'm still in New York City makes it, I feel like, you know, people that are in town for two days from Japan, et cetera, can still pop by my studio to see work. So, um, I mean, there's, I can't really think of too many other places I'd rather be or have a studio than in the city. And um, even as my career grows and changes and shifts, I still, even, you know, I have a house outside the city, but New York City will always be my, um, like my main hub. Great. Yeah. I like that. I feel like New York is like, obviously a bit cliche, but it really is just this sort of centralized hub of creativity and like you said like if people are just coming into the city for a quick visit it's such a great spot to just invite people in as it's so accessible which i love yeah i mean there's a there's a pace to things too that that's just so great you know like you know you know like my sculptures are made in spain and mm -hmm. and, and i do some silk screen paintings that's made in long island city but there's like a nice kind of like pace to getting things done here that kind of like moves everything else along yeah um, very fast paced rhythm which i love that's great. Um, so cool. So what exactly is it about like the aesthetics of space exploration that drew you into them? I mean, it started with, you know, I had a, uh, this was back in 2003, I had a postgraduate uh, residency and, you know, I was pretty much given a studio for the year to do whatever I wanted. And that was the first, I went to New York Academy of Art. So I was trained painting the figure. Mm. And then uh, this was the first time I kind of, I could do whatever I wanted. And, you know, from growing up and my dad teaching me a lot about the space program and stuff because he was into it, um, I was like, okay, what am I going to paint? And I was like, I'm going to paint an astronaut because I liked painting with like these thick squeegee strokes and thick brush marks. And then, you know, I did one, turned out pretty good. Turned two, I can do it better. And then once I had a body of work, that's what gave me my first show. And, um, and then, you know, that's what I became known for. But, you know, now I do, I'm doing paintings of Formula One drivers. I've done uh, shows on big wave surfing on um, the death zone mountains like K2 and Everest. So like the core of my work is the astronaut space travel work, but then I've gone and done shows that have related it to, to it in one way or another. And, um, you know, and, and, and m with most of my paintings, it's, I'm not trying to get into like a scene, like narrative painting, like, you know, my astronaut paintings are just like astronaut, not much else going on. Um, the mountain paintings I've done are just like a mountain. Um, because I, you know, my, my paintings are so complex with the, these thick brush marks that I really wanted to be this like combo of these, like, um, these thick abstract brush marks that really fall away, fall apart when you're close together and tighten up into almost a photographic image when you back away. And, um, and, you know, I use the analogy sometimes that like, if you're at a crowded opening and you can just peek in the distance and see one of my paintings, then it will just be like, boom, astronaut, because it will be that iconic figure of an astronaut it won't be like okay let me get closer to see what's going on in the background and stuff that won't be necessary so i kind of like um 
these like almost, you know, I call them like quick reads because the painting can be read quick. You know, it's a, it's a mountain, it's a surfer, it's a, it's a race car. Um, so yeah. Cool, cool. So in, before we dive a bit deeper into Apollo 11, could you explain your relationship with Bill Powers and how your relationship with him sort of came to be in Half Gallery? Right, so, so, so Bill is one of these examples that I consider one of my good friends in the art world. You know, I've known him for over a decade and you know, you know we've, we've, we, we did, we've done print editions together. We've done different collaborations. You know, he's shown my paintings, he sold my paintings. And then, um, you know, and, and he's one of those guys that, you know, as my career shifts and takes different levels, he'll always be, you know, a great support and friend in the art world. So, um, so you know, I have, an, I, have a sh I have a painting show planned with him, but, um, you know, he, you know, Bill came to me and he was just like, he, Bill knew that I was starting to do more sculpture you know, I've done this big bronze astronaut sculpture and Bill said, you know, what if we did an inflatable sculpture for uh, our Basel? We floated it out in the water. And I said, I said, I like this idea. And I was like, but I think we should take it a step further. And instead of it just being an inflatable, you know, because an inflatable, you inflate and then deflate, it's done. I said, yeah. let's, make a, let's make a real sculpture. And then, you know, you can see like Bill's eyes light up and he's just like, are, have there been any floating sculptures before? I don't know. And he's like racking his brain because, you know, mm -hmm. Bill's like, encyclopedia of uh, art history he knows everything which is you know part of his charm um so so you know we started the ball rolling and you know because of the the factum who makes my helps me make my um sculptures in spain you know I, I said hey can you guys help me make this capsule and they're like absolutely and um so you know with my with my bronze sculptures you know they're addition they're cast bronze um they're usually addition of three um, with the, with this capsule that Bill and I made, it's one of one. It was all fabricated. Um, it's got like a steel structure. Then we put like high density foam, and then it's got ABS plastic over it. So it's like this like very solid structure. And it's my interpretation of the Apollo 11 capsule, which you know the, the command modules, you know, on the tip of the rocket, and that's what you know the astronauts sit in when they when they launch into space. And the um, command module, the capsule, it's the only piece of Apollo 11 that came back down to earth and you know when it landed in the water it, had, it lands by parachutes and splashes down and then these inflatables come out to keep it floating while they rescue the astronauts and um it's like very like beautiful and cinematic the way it comes down and it splashes and then you know the boat comes up and they take these astronauts out and the astronauts are just like you know they just came in through the atmosphere so they're almost like they have to be like carried out and um so so you know the the sculpture for miami is Apollo, which I thought was a good title because, um, you know, it's the only piece of Apollo that came back. So uh, this, the, the capsule is going to be floating in the bay. And um, we sim like we simplified the form a little bit. So it's, it's kind of different shades of gray and silver. And it's, um, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. The scales, it's almost to scale. And um, yeah, it's going to be floating out off the Mondrian for the week of uh, Miami Basel. That's so cool. And I like how you said it's like, it's the only piece of Apollo 11 that came back. And I feel like that sort of just like humanizes it a little bit as I feel like it's just makes it a bit more tangible. Is it something that's probably a bit more relative towards what people are familiar with? So I think it's going to be so cool having people actually see the exhibit in person. And right. two, another thing I find so fascinating about you is in the past year alone, you've really been able to push your sort of visual language into new mediums by creating, like you said, one of your first sculptures, Astronaut, as well as the A7L helmet. And I was curious to know, how has sort of the creative process differed between those two and then sort of arguably leveling up times like 100 to create something like this? I mean, I, I mean I'm a big, like, even when I've lectured in the past at different schools, grad programs, um, like I always say, like a couple of things, like, you know, what if you're painting sculpture, or whatever, but you should paint, you should do things to your strength. You should know mm -hmm. like your strength, do it. And then also you should just let things happen organically and, and not force it. So, you know, I couldn't have pulled off projects like this 10 years ago because, you know, they're very complicated to do and you need like a really good team of people assisting you who you trust that can, you know, work well with you. So, you know, 
the, the way the sculpture projects kind of came, you know, I worked on a edition of a small astronaut figure with a team of designers and we were trying to translate the, um, the aesthetic of my paintings. And this wasn't a quick process. This took like well over a year to go mm -hmm. back. And forth. And so we felt like we had a good visual language. And then we did a collectible of a small astronaut. And then, you know, once I had the digital file, um, you know, we decided to do a bronze of it. And then I have a, I have a sculpture in a show with, with Almin in London in June, and it's a whole new figure. Um, but now I have the visual language. So it's like my painting strokes are always evolving. And I think in my mind getting better. So I feel like with the sculpture, you know, it's evolving as well. And then, um, so it just felt like the right time to do a sculpture. And then, um, you know, so, you know, it's, I have this digital file, we've done the sculptures, you know, um, you know, I've done an NFT with it. So it's just like the way that like my painting fed into the sculpture, but it was just like a natural process. And then because I have this sculpture, I've done um, different digital work with it as well. And then so the, the and then because I had the team in place from the bronze sculpture, the, um, the capsule was like a no brainer. It was just like, I didn't have to look for who could make it. I already knew the team that could make it. And then, um, you know, I use Factum in Spain and, you know, we're like, good friends now because it's like an extension of my studio. So, you know, for my other sculpture projects coming up in June, you know, we're already working on them. And then I've been going back and forth to Spain. So it's, you know, I don't think it would have made sense to do this years ago because it would have seemed kind of forced and kind of like, like, oh, I want to make a sculpture. And now it's just the way it kind of just like happened organically. I feel like it's just, and now there's a good flow. I feel like I have, um, you know, I have like my painting, I have my paintings. I do print releases a few times a year. You know, I was very early on into NFTs because of my relationship with the Winklevoss twins that are collectors of mine. And then, um, so, and so they have my NFTs and then I have, now I have my sculptures and I feel like none of them are fighting each other. They're just complementing each other and they're all working kind of like organically together because of the way that they all happen like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't like, oh, I want to do NFTs. Let me do one. It was just, you know, the opportunity was presented to itself to, to myself very early, and then it just happened. And then, um, you know, so everything kind of fed into each other, which I think is kind of like a nice way to work. And then, um, you know, and all the time in, in my studio, you know, I'm just here painting nonstop. But the painting ideas feed into different sculpture ideas and stuff like that. So it's it's a really nice flow, and I feel like um. It, you know, it took a long time to get here, but you know, I'm really enjoying it now because it's, I, I'm really enjoying all the multiple projects that are really overlapping all the time. Mm. And it sounds like, obviously there's a lot going on, but it sounds like it's happening in an almost seamless way where like you said, everything is complementing each other. So it doesn't sound like it's too overwhelming, which is always nice. It's always nice and complimentary. Yeah, I mean, I think you have like good people assisting you, you know, like I have, I have the guys in Spain, you know, you know, Bill, Bill Powers is very hands-on. So he's over at my studio a lot and we're brainstorming different mm. ideas. He came to Spain with me to check on the capsule production. And um, we went to Fort Miami a few, like a month or two ago mm -hmm. to make sure we had the exact site location picked out for the, um, for the capsule. So I feel like, you know, you have a really good team of people around you. And then, um, and then it's just like, you know, the paintings I make alone and I'm very, like, I don't think that will ever change. Like the only people that touch my paintings is me, no one else. I have mm -hmm. someone help my canvases, but as far as putting paint on the surface, it's just me. But I feel like for some of these other projects, you know, it takes a lot of trust to let someone else work on your projects with you. So, and I feel like the only way to do that is to really have the best of the best, which in my mind I found. And then, um, you know, and then instead of, you know, going back and forth to Spain, sending, you know, texts, back and forth Zoom calls and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's part of the studio practice now, but then um, but then you get the exact result you want. And at the end of the day, you know, the, these are sculptures that are worked on by a team of people, but um, you know, it's my art. So, you know, we're all working on it together. So, so it's, it's, it's a process and you know, there, there's the process of painting in the studio. And then there's the process of making these sculptures. Um, and, and I think, and it's equally enjoyable. It's just a different type of, um, process hmm. and going back on like a recent conversation you had with bill powers one thing that you said was that space tourism has almost become a reality show and that instead of the best and the brightest we are now flying celebrities and billionaires up into orbit 
And I'm curious to get your take on this in that, do you think that this change in spacecraft sort of inhabitants has taken away from the awe of space travel? No, you know what, I, I, you know what, that's so funny because I, I saw this question and I thought about this. I was actually having a conversation with someone last night mm -hmm. at a Thanksgiving dinner. And, um, you know, I think in the beginning, I kind of take that comment back a little bit because I feel like in the early days of anything, there needs to be kind of a spectacle around it to attract, yeah. the, to attract the attention. So like even with the Apollo missions, like why did the Apollo space program at, a, at you know, at Apollo 17 die down? The last mission to the moon in 1972, last time we were on the moon, um, right. you know, because it kind of like lost its luster because going to the moon what had become routine, which is ridiculous to even think that going to the moon had become routine. So, but I feel like, you know, Apollo 11, the first moon landing, you know, everyone, the whole world, I think it's one, it's still one of the most televised events in human history. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like, I feel like with these early days, I feel like to get more people excited about space travel again, you know, it, it, there needs to be some spectacle about it. It needs to be like constant news coverage. You know, William Shatner, I think is a great, was a great idea because, and also who better to tell the story of what it's like to be in space than guys like William Shatner and um, stuff like that. So I feel like until it, until it becomes routine again, which, you know, space travel is gonna become routine in the next like few years. I think it maybe in the early days, it does make it sense to make it more of a reality show. I actually thought about that comment last night. And then, and then I think the next thing that's gonna be important is, you know, one of my good friends is astronaut Leland Melvin, retired. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, he's big into education. And I think the next phase will be important to get like educators up there, writers, artists, poets, uh, public school teachers, oh, everyone from every walk of life to try to get some people up there so they can come back down to earth and explain teach classes, te teach high school students what it's like to be in space. And that will inspire the next generation and stuff. So I feel like it's, um, with space travel happening again, there's gotta, it's, it's almost like a little like tiered and like, you know, you gotta have some steps to make it done. Um, so yeah, but that's funny, that question, because I thought about that last <laughs> night. Great. Do you think if you were ever given the opportunity that you would travel up there? Yeah, no, totally. I, I, it's funny because, um, one of my collectors, uh, Yusa Kamazawa, He's going up with the Russians to the space station. I think very soon. I think this month, and oh, then cool. um, and then he he actually got all the seats on one of the uh, Elon Musk uh, ro uh, rockets that's going to go around the moon. So I like to think that I had a chance. And then um, <laughs> and then um, when I was getting um, you know, I was getting I wore contacts. I was getting corrected by surgery a few mm -hmm. years ago. I wanted the PRK, which is the more complicated. And the doctor's like, "Why do you want the more complicated? It's soil recovery." And like, and I was just like, because if you pull G forces, you need the PRK. So like fighter pilots, stuff like that, they always get PRK. So oh, you cool. think, pull G forces. and the doctor's like, come on, man. Like, when are you going to pull G forces? And I, <laughs> and, I was like, and, I was, and I said with like a straight face, I was like, when I go to the moon. Yeah, right. Really? Like, on the moon. I was just like, and I broke it down for him. I was like, listen, like some like a step by step process. <laughs> perfectly realistic that I go with them. I want the PRK. He's like, okay, so. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm planning on it. You know, I have two kids. I have a wife. My wife said she supports my decision. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh my God. I love it. That sounds just like an absolute dream. And I feel like it would just like, I feel like it's like all your work that you're doing, obviously like in art, like would anything even top going to the moon? Like that would just oh, I, mean, I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, I think, I mean, it'd be amazing to see how the work shifts when you come mm -hmm. back. You know? Yeah. Right. And, you know, and it's funny because like, I feel like, I feel like, with my knowledge of the uh, astronaut and space program, I feel like worthy to paint it. Mm -hmm. And like sometimes when I painted the Formula One images, I feel like I have to back up a second and really kind of study what I'm doing, like the history of it, the driver, et cetera, before I like paint it. Cause I feel like it needs to be like, you need, you need to be like worthy of painting it. But, um, but I feel like if you actually went to space, then you could really be like, boom, I'm worthy yeah, of painting right? it to space. <laughs> And like you said too, I'd be so curious too to see like if the sort of like creative vision changes or shifts at all after you like finally see it in person. I mean, it's got to. I mean, that, that, that's what I was talking about with like sending educators up and poets. I mean, Leland, you know, the astronaut I was talking to, he said, um, you know, there's this thing called like orbital perspective. You know, when you're like orbiting Earth and you're looking down that like you come back and like your brain's actually like rewired a little bit. The way mm -hmm. you think about things, the way you think about like you know, like mankind, you know, politics, borders, countries, because you've seen the earth as a whole, like looking down at it. Um, 
So I feel like that would be fun to see how it changes both your outlook on life and, um, and also how your, your work would change. Great. Amazing. Cool. So lastly, what projects or things are you excited most for 2022? For, for 22, I mean, I, a couple things. I'm doing, a, um, I'm doing two print releases with a, one, of, one of my favorite collectors, Masahiro Maki, who is based in Japan, has a beautiful museum in Japan with some of my best work. And we're doing probably my largest scale astronaut print is be coming out. Um, beautiful, beautiful print. We've, I've already signed them. And then we're also going to be doing later in the year a box set of the Apollo astronauts as a print edition. And then awesome. doing another NFT release in February. And then um, I have a few sculpture projects. And then in June, I have a, a sh solo show with Almin in London. And for that one, it's going to kind of be like a, um, I'm excited about that show because it's going to, I'm kind of pulling out all the stops. It's going to be like the best of the best work I, from how all my new processes from the last couple of years. So like, I've been doing these squeegee paintings. I'm making this massive squeegee paintings. I'm going to have two new sculptures. Um, one's going to be more of an installation. Um, you know, I mean, really gave me the full gallery to work with. So I'm, rather than it just being a painting show, I'm really pulling out all the stops. Um, so that's one of the main focuses. But um, but yeah, I mean, the past year has been busy and I think the next year is going to be busier. But, I, you know, it's like what we were saying from the beginning of this conversation, like all the overlaps are completely just like complementing each other.